This podcast is sponsored by CH Aviation, the world's leading airline intelligence provider since 1998. Try two weeks of powerful access to our pro product absolutely free at ch-aviation.com forward slash airline weekly. That's ch-aviation.com forward slash airline weekly. Of course, we've all come to expect Ryanair to make money with each and every earnings report. But in the first quarter of 2016, the ultra-low-cost carrier was faced with a tough environment, one that included terrorism, air traffic controller strikes, weak economies, and overcapacity. On top of that, the first quarter is easily Europe's weakest quarter. And this one amazed me. Through the wonders of hedging, Ryanair's fuel bill actually increased by 16%. So Seth, in light of that, which would be the more interesting result, that Ryanair didn't make money in Q1 or that it did? Uh, both. I should have seen that coming. All right, well, Ryanair did make money. In fact, the airline did really well, posting a 6% operating margin. For perspective, that 6% compares with 4% for the first quarter of 2015, last year, and to negative 4%. For the first quarter of 2014, so you know, two years ago. And both of those turned out to be very successful years overall. So that's 6%, a really good start to the year. I'm Jason Cottrell, Vice President of Airline Weekly. And I'm Seth Kaplan, Managing Partner of Airline Weekly. We're going to talk about Ryanair's resilient quarter. And naturally, we'll talk about Ryanair rivals, Wizz Air and EasyJet, who are both doing fine as well. We'll talk about HNA Group purchasing a bit of Virgin Australia, and we'll check in on the TSA situation in the U.S. It's all coming up on the Airline Weekly Lounge. Thanks for joining us in the Airline Weekly Lounge, where our guiding principle, our theme, if you will, is how to make money in the airline industry. No stranger to making money is Ryanair, who posted great numbers in Q1. Seth, how are they doing it? Well, through a combination of uh, relatively resilient revenues uh, alongside their always industry-leading costs. So, you know, you add it all up, uh, low costs and high revenues it usually enable you to make pretty good money in the airline industry. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the fuel bill increased. Uh, so, yeah, the, the impressive thing for Ryanair is it's really the non-fuel costs where it's kept doing really, really well. Uh, but even those fuel costs, uh, you said up 16 percent. Sounds like it's not great, you know, considering what happened to oil prices and, and you know, the, the kinds of declines other airlines have experienced. And indeed, uh, you know, their wrong way hedges cost them quite a lot. But they grew 23 percent. For the quarter. So the differential there still impressive. They still paid less, uh, you know, kind of on a unit cost basis uh, for fuel than they uh, had the year prior. And yeah, and then uh, on top of that, just that growth enabled them to keep knocking down the non-fuel costs. They just continue to become an ever more productive airline. So uh, you add it all up and yeah, you get an airline that, as we mentioned there in the intro before, 6% might not sound great, but when you're a European airline and you start off the year that way, it gives you a pretty nice head start in the race. We hear about Ryanair's fantastic growth rate, and at the same time, we hear about overcapacity. Growing in an oversupplied market seems like a foolish endeavor, but Ryanair is still winning. Can you unpack that for us? Well, yeah, I, I mean, there, there are, to state the obvious, the things you can control and the things you can't. You know, the market is going to be, from Ryanair's perspective, oversupplied. Uh, regardless of what Ryanair does, it's a huge airline, but it's still only one airline. You know, it's it's not the majority of capacity the capacity in the marketplace. So, um, you know, so you have the industry growing, growing faster than economic growth, and thus faster than demand, and that means you're you're going to have downward pressure on fares. So, you know, from Ryanair's pressure, from Ryanair's uh, perspective, rather, it, it can either let everybody else grow and not grow, which would put upward pressure on its costs. A moment ago, we talked about how, how well it's doing on, on uh, costs because of its growth. Well, you don't grow. You're, you're not going to keep achieving scale, achieving those those ever lower unit costs. It, it would hurt on the cost side. And, you know, in terms of the revenue, I mean, look, everybody else would still be growing. The marketplace would still be growing. And so it would basically uh, have the worst of both worlds. It would experience still some of the downward pressure on revenue because it's 
you know, because it doesn't operate in a vacuum because, uh, you know, the, the, the because industry wide capacity would still be growing and yet its cost would be pressured. And so, uh, you know, that's why if you are the lowest cost provider, um, you're often going to look at this and say, look, the way I can differentiate myself is uh, just to keep growing and, and just to maintain that unit cost differential. That's somewhere something we see, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world. Um, you know, let's say in the U.S. Uh, as well, where different airlines have different perspectives on the capacity situation. Um, but uh, the LCCs, especially the ultra LCCs, is still growing very rapidly, you know, probably because that's how they see it. Hey, look, let's just maintain our cost disadvantage. And, uh, you know, we, from their perspective, they would think, you know, we've never been as dependent on revenue as the uh, legacy carriers anyway. So, uh, you know, the differential, they hope will enable them to uh, maintain their, their overall prof- profitability leadership. Ryanair has a wage freeze on management at the moment. Is it strange for an airline to be enjoying one of its most prosperous times ever and be under a wage freeze? Yeah, kind of. Um, but, you know, they, they do have some other issues to deal with. Uh, they're, they're always, um, you know, trying to maintain their status as a as a non-union airline and, uh, you know, just, just various threats all around them all the time, legal threats and so forth. Um, you know, they, they, they outsource a lot, you know, they use staffing companies even, even for their, uh, their pilots, you know, which is something that's is somewhat more unusual than, uh, outsourcing ground handling and that sort of thing. You, you know, this among other things, first and foremost, simply saving money, which, which they like to do. But, uh, uh in addition to that, you know, it, it, it does enable them to say, look, we're we're showing uh, cost leadership from the top. You know, it's not that we're raking it in while we're asking uh, you to uh, help keep our costs, uh, our cost inflation modest, uh, because you know management is is uh, making sacrifices too. When you look at the other European ULCCs, Ryanair seems to be getting some separation. We talked about Ryanair's six percent operating margin in Q1. In the same quarter, Wizz Air posted a break-even margin. Vueling posted a negative six and EasyJet over its past two quarters reported a negative 1% margin. Is the differential between Ryanair and the rest all that significant? Not in the sense that it, it, it generally speaking, it's, it's not increasing. Um, you, you mentioned Wiz first, actually just looked it up. So Ryanair this year is about six points better than them. Last year, they were eight points better. Uh, you know, so they both improved, um, but Ryanair actually improved less than Wizz Air, although just just marginally so. I mean, they're both on track for for an excellent year. Voiling and EasyJet a little bit less so. You know, Ryanair um, actually established some distance against the, uh, those two, but again, I mean, we're talking about you know a percentage points or two, not nothing nothing dramatic. So you know, mostly it's just Ryanair is the most profitable airline in general, um, and and uh, and is is that as well. Uh, during the first quarter, but um, but all of those um, very successful airlines, just a question of degree. Regarding EasyJet, when they reported a few weeks ago, we said in Airline Weekly that they are downplaying the threat that Ryanair poses now that it's accommodating business traffic. Is Easy EasyJet right to downplay that threat? Look, there's there's obviously a a, a big market out there, a, a, you know, the corporate travel community. And in the broadest sense, um, you know, corporations have been looking for alternatives to, to legacy airlines. I mean, it's nothing new. You know, you, you've just been carrying a lot of that traffic. So, you know, there, there, there is plenty of business to go around. But, yeah, it, it, Ryanair is a threat. I mean, I mean, you know, they now are focusing on, on this segment that has been already rather important to EasyJet. I mean, to be clear, that's not the majority of EasyJet's business, but it's an important part of EasyJet's business. And Ryanair has now decided to make it a, an important part of its business. Uh, and Ryanair is the lower cost carrier. So, uh, no, it's 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 important. But, you know, EasyJet is still doing fine and uh, will probably continue to do fine, particularly in light of the fact that uh, they don't bump up against each other as much as you might expect. Uh, they, they just have different geographic strengths. Uh, and although that might be changing a little bit, yeah, generally speaking, there's enough business to go around for the two of them. Both those airlines are growing, and should we expect that overlap to accelerate or become more of a concern in the future? Yeah, you know, right now, not not a lot of direct overlap. Ryanair, of course, just in the past couple of years, has uh, started moving into more of the the primary airports. Uh, you know, something that EasyJet has done. Uh, for a long time, yeah. I mean, look, they they are they 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 are, and they will continue to bump up each other against each other 
more than they had previously. Um, but but remember, in Europe in particular, uh, when you talk about primary airports, you know these are not places that you can just show up in 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 many cases. Uh, you know these are slot constrained airports where you know EasyJet has spent a decade and a half uh, acquiring a, a slot portfolio, and uh, you know. Now, uh, Ryanair will also be able to get its hands on some slots. You know, there there are other desperate airlines. They're going to be, you know, in, in situations where they'll have to sell their slots. And, and Ryanair certainly has the balance sheet to uh, do what it has to to get them and so forth. But, yeah, it, it's it's, uh, you know, still generally speaking, EasyJet is, is, is much more of the airline uh, serving the primary airports. It's the higher fare airline. There's enough room in Europe for the, uh, for the two of them. But, uh, but yeah, you know, it just, just, you know, if the simple question is, would EasyJet probably prefer, you know, Ryanair to do what it's doing or not, you'd have to say probably not, you know, Ryanair obviously saw an opportunity there as, as uh, Michael O'Leary has been going around saying uh, over the past couple of years, you know, just the, you know, to be nice to customers and, uh, and, uh, they're, they're, they're doing well with it. And, uh, and certainly at least to some degree moving in on a territory that, that easy jet, well, although it didn't have it to itself, you know, it was the largest, uh, low cost carrier that was providing somewhat of a corporate travel focus. Wizz Air, meanwhile, posted a net profit of a million dollars in Q1. That's a small figure, but it's a big deal in that it's the first time it's ever happened in the quarter. Yeah, I mentioned a minute ago the the uh, the closing gap between uh, Wiz and Ryanair for the first quarter. Uh, and you're right, in Wiz Air's case, it it um, you know its improvement put it uh, put it into the black for the first quarter. And this is an airline that that does very well, uh, generally speaking, for the whole year. So, and, and that's you know despite the fact that in most years it does lose money that quarter. So. Uh, a really good start to the year uh, by by making money. Um, now look these these rising fuel costs recently. Um, you know, don't forget we're talking about falling fuel prices. We're kind of looking backward at, at the first quarter and talking about uh, the fact that uh, that those fuel costs are were down significantly compared to a year ago. You know, we're not far now from being back in a situation where the year over year comps on on fuel costs are going to show increases. Uh, you know, absent hedging, which is just increased spot. Prices and if that continues, then um, uh, you know, obviously it's going to put pressure on the cost side uh, on all airlines. That that has been a, a massive tailwind for everybody, uh, almost everybody anyway, in the world. And and uh, you know they've on a year over year basis, uh, many airlines have have by right about now pretty much lost that. So um, you know so we have to keep an eye on that because with all kinds of other issues to face, if we don't continue to have declining fuel prices as indeed we have not had for the past several months that's going to be bad news for everybody but uh yeah whiz air certainly in in, in about as good a shape as anybody whiz grew capacity 20 percent year over year that's in the same ballpark as ryan air's 23 percent growth in scheduled capacity both are healthy numbers these two carriers are already butting heads on the route map i guess what i want to know is how is this going to play out <laughs> Good question. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know for a long time uh, they really did stay out of each other's way. You know, Eastern Europe was mostly a hole in Ryanair's route map. Uh, it, it didn't dabble much there, and Wizz Air is is very much an Eastern European specialist. Now, one I don't want to say little known fact, but I don't think everybody knows. Do you know Wizz Air? Of course, uh, sort of ubiquitous in Eastern Europe. Do you do you know Jason what its um what its busiest airport of all is? Um. No, it's London. So it actually has more operations there. But what it does from there is fly to Eastern Europe, a lot of migrant traffic, uh, you know, as well as, uh, you know, uh, Brits going on holiday to all the lovely places in, in, in Eastern Europe. But yeah, so uh, so now you have Ryanair going uh, going to the east and really taking on Wiz in, in its own neighborhood. Look, it's Wiz because it's smaller and because it is so Eastern European focused in general is the more vulnerable of the two. It's it's I mean it's in great shape. It's making a lot of money, but you know if it is now in Ryanair's crosshairs, you have to worry more about Wiz than you do about Ryanair because Ryanair is just as the larger um, airline, the more geographically diversified airline is just more able to move capacity around than is Wiz. Um, so you know you, you'd have to call that. Uh, not great news for Wizz Air, um, but again, we're talking about an airline with very low costs, an airline 
with, you know, backed by Indigo Partners, the you know sort of the successful ultra LCC investment and management group. You know, the airline that backed the transformation at Spirit and you know is behind the one at Frontier and so forth around the world. You know, and 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 again, just an airline with very very low costs, following a model that has worked very well around the world. For all of these carriers, how big of a deal was it that Easter was included in Q1 results? Oh, a very big deal. It, you know, it, it, busy, busy travel period. So yeah, it 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 sometimes falls entirely within the first quarter, uh, sometimes entirely within the second quarter, and then sometimes if it's either at the sort of end of March, beginning of April, you can have some of the traffic in uh, both periods. So yeah, you know, when we talk about those. Um, in some cases, you know, slight improvements for the first quarter uh, compared to last year. That can largely be explained in some cases just by the fact that Easter was uh, uh, during the first quarter. By the way, uh, Passover this year was uh, firmly within the second quarter. Eastern, Easter and Passover, more often than not, roughly coincide. Uh, they come about the same time. And this year, that didn't happen. So, you know, in places where that matters, um, yeah, Passover was the second quarter event, um, but not not a, not not a huge impact on traffic in, in Europe. Easter is the uh, the far far bigger holiday. Okay, let's close the European ULCC segment of the show. Say that three times fast. <laughs> with dun dun dun, an existential question. Seth, who'd you rather be? Ryanair, who is facing a sea of zombie airline competition, many of which, of course, are weak airlines, or Spirit Airlines, who at the moment in the U.S. is facing much more rational competition, but also much more healthy competition? Ah, this is a tougher question than it should be, and I'll tell you why. So generally, the answer is you'd, you would rather face the, the more rational competition. You know, you'd rather be operating in a more healthy environment, um, you know, even if that means healthy competitors, uh, you know, just running through my head, just all the times that, uh, you know, sort of exasperated airlines have talked about how they wish they, uh, you know, their competition would be more rational. And then when they've been happy that it was more rational. So, yeah, generally speaking, that's the case. And you so you would say you'd want to be spirit. The thing, though, is that. Spirit, I talked a minute ago about somebody being in somebody's crosshairs. What did I say? Was there a writer's crosshairs? Spirit is very much in the crosshairs um, of that competition. Um, they are taking a very different approach. Um, I'm talking especially about, you know, American Airlines because Spirit competes uh, head to head in a lot of markets in, 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 at Dallas Fort Worth. But, you know, certainly Delta was the first to come out with, uh, you know, one of these basic economy fair products where. You know, it's, it's, it's an ultra LCC type of uh, fair product you buy, and it's totally non-refundable. You don't get any advanced seat assignments and, and so forth. Uh, you know, American and United are both going to do that. Those airlines um, have rather clearly drawn a line and, and, uh, and decided that they're not going to let the ultra LCCs continue to grow under their noses, under the noses of the legacy airlines, that is, which is different. I think Spirit for a long time just sort of looked at this and not only spirit you know allegiant and frontier as well but as uh, you know hey you can start one flight a day between you know dallas and chicago and when the you know between dallas and new orleans and you know all kinds of other markets where um you know they're huge markets and the, the legacy airlines will, will basically let you get away with it as long as you're not competitive on frequencies against them, you know, as long as you're offering a kind of service that you know, corporate travelers aren't going to be uh, tempted by and that sort of thing. Um, the, the, the competitive environment seems to be changing uh, and those legacy airlines seem to seem to have said, look, we're, we're not going to just let them do what they want as long as it's only up to a certain point anymore. And they are competing much more aggressively against the ultra LCCs. So if you are an ultra LCC, you know, certainly if you're spirit, all of a sudden, just sort of all those dots that you could connect, you know, you just, just, you know, hundreds of permutations of just all these, you know, kind of uh, large and mid-sized cities that you just kind of connect them to each other and you fly it once a day and nobody's going to bother you. Well, um, if they're not going to let you have your way with that, it, it does change your opportunities somewhat, you know, and we see spirit in, in particular talking uh, about getting into more of the, well, you might call them allegiant like markets, you know, sort of more of the small markets. We see them now newly interested again in A319s, uh, you know, smaller planes that, you know, you might put down in a market that can't support a service on a larger plane. 
And, you know, while that makes sense, uh, you know, based on what they're facing, on the other hand, when you're an ultra low cost carrier talking about, you know, purposely taking on sort of higher unit cost aircraft uh, to kind of thread the needle and go into different kinds of markets than are the ones you probably really wanted to go into. You know, that, that's that's a, that's a trickier environment. You know, that's not the same environment that enabled them to, you know, to, to put up the kinds of very impressive numbers that they have been putting up for a number of years. So given that, it's a uh, it, it's a tough call, uh, especially because, you know, the fragmented European airline industry, you would think, has only one way to go. We have a cover story in the newsletter this week about uh, about Finnair um, and, you know, whether it might be sort of the next domino to fall in terms of consolidation, uh, you know, who knows, being bought by IAG or something. Anyway, your Europe is so fragmented. Um, so if you believe that that's going to get so- somewhat better, because it seems like it can only get better and not worse, then from that perspective, maybe uh, maybe you'd rather be Ryanair. Is there anybody you'd rather be than Ryanair then? Um, yeah, not, not, not too many, uh, uh, airlines in the world. Uh, I mean, well, from the very simple perspective that they are, uh, about the most profitable airline in the world, I mean, you know, uh, always in the top, you know, two, three, four anyway, by, uh, by margin, um, and even close to that by net profit, even though they're not you know, nearly as large as some others. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're, they are as impervious to, uh, all the problems in the world as, um, as, as anybody else, um, you know, it, it uh, because, you know, even, you know, if, if you think about from a network perspective, you know, short haul Europe uh, can often be a tough place to be. And obviously as a short haul airline, they, they you know, can't diversify uh, to the, to, you know, to, to points distant abroad. But the point is the reason that Europe short haul Europe is tough is because of Ryanair and its competitor. You know, they make it tough on, on, uh, the ultra LCC make it tough on, on the legacy airlines. So short haul Europe is fine for Ryanair. Yeah. So they, they are, uh, as, as well positioned as, as anybody. Okay. Moving out of Europe, we got the announcement that China's HNA aviation is buying a stake in Virgin Australia. HNA has made a lot of strategic purchases around the world, including a large share of Brazil's Azul last year. Is this the same strategy as we've seen with, say, Etihad? Yeah, roughly speaking. Um, I mean, the structure is a little different. But, you know, in this case, you have a kind of a holding company. It, the the largest airline within that that group is is Hainan Airlines. Actually, actually, a very successful airline in its own right. And then you have all these other airlines within the empire that are, you know. The, the, not as successful in, in many cases, not nearly, in, you know, not not in the same universe as as Hainan, you know. Whereas Etihad, it's it's kind of more, you know, the airline doing it directly. But having said all that, well, you called them strategic purposes, um, uh, purchases rather. And I, I guess um, uh, even though that's uh, technically what they're called, I guess the question is, how strategic are they? You know, it may be a matter of ex- <laughs> execution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's I, I guess you know some of them at least are. Well, I don't even know if I could say. It. I was going to say maybe less of head scratchers than some of the uh, Etihad ones. You know, look, they 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 bought a piece of Azul in a uh, Azul operating you know, a very very tough uh, Brazilian market right now. Um, you know, maybe over the very long term that'll turn out well. Eagle Azor in in France, a French airline, and and so forth. And now this, uh, you know, Virgin Australia, an airline that uh, is um, is is full of strategic owners, um, and and uh, maybe light on owners who are interested in in financial returns. Um, you know, if you if you look at you know just just who owns the airline. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, you you could you could point out um differences uh but it but it's yeah it's, it's it's very much an airline that is uh uh seems to be interested in putting together a portfolio of uh pieces of various uh well airlines with with uh with mixed records at, at best of uh success around the world and then uh i guess figuring out later in terms of the uh the profits yeah, you mentioned uh, the many owners that Virgin Australia has, and it reminds me of when I bought a condo in Florida. Yeah, it seems smart at first. You get all these amenities like a giant swimming pool, and you get all the shared costs. But then you learn you have this condo board to deal with, <laughs> and this board might not have the same interests as you. And you realize you've gone into a gone in on a huge investment with people who can be well 
irrational at times. Now, do your fellow former condo board members uh, listen to this podcast? I'm hoping not. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, uh, and, and that and that's the thing is that they all are strategic rather than financial owners, you know, to one degree or another. Now, one of those owners, Air New Zealand, actually became very frustrated uh, at the the state of of um, Virgin Australia's finances and is, you know, looking to sell its stake. So, so they all have these strategic interests um, that are not really aligned because everybody's kind of trying to use the airline to feed their own networks, to feed their own hubs. Uh, you know, is, is Virgin Australia going to send more traffic to Abu Dhabi or to, uh, you know, Singapore and, and so forth? And so, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it can be a mess, you know, as, as, as the airline's financial results show, you know, it, it's uh, taken on all kinds of complexity and cost in recent years uh, compared to the you know, the low cost carrier that it, that it began life as, uh, you know, originally Virgin Blue. Um, and, and really without financial results to show for it, even as Qantas, you know, operating in the same environment has has really turned itself around. So, um, I mean, look, it, it, HNA it just might be looking to park capital and various airline investments around the world and virgin australia was happy to have a buyer no it's 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 an airline uh, that, that clearly has issues and with um a lot to be determined uh, particularly about what happens with air new zealand's ownership stake because uh, uh the you know that, that's clearly a, a, a very awkward situation right now uh air new zealand virgin australia important joint venture partners and, and you know air new zealand would probably hate to lose them as a as, as as a partner across the Tasman, um, but uh, but clearly not interested in in uh, owning a part of a business that's performing as Virgin Australia has been performing. And back in the U.S., we haven't talked about the TSA situation on the show. That's mostly because we're a business show, not so much about operations. But here we have operations affecting business. Very much so. Yeah. For. For anybody who uh, hasn't read a newspaper or watched the TV newscast and, and, and only gets their information from the Airline Weekly Lounge, God help you. God help you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so you have these these really long lines of security in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, and there are all kinds of reasons, but you know, just it starts with more people traveling and fewer security screeners, and you know, uh, the math on that isn't good. So uh, so yeah, you have. Lots of passengers not making their flights. You have bags being mishandled because of this, um, you know, depending on who you ask, a uh, combination of uh, either understaffing or, uh, you know, not, not using the resources that exist well, probably some combination of the two. And so you had airlines complaining um, pretty loudly about that and, and more recently actually pitching in to, to, to help because they realized that, look, in the end, if air travel becomes so much of a hassle that people don't want to do it, you know, if there's some way that they can uh, that they can help without, you know, breaking uh, their own balance sheets, uh, then they want to do that. And, you know, fortunately, airline, U.S. airlines doing well enough these days that, uh, you know, American airlines went out and spent four million dollars hiring people to help TSA. Uh, Delta had already lent some of its own staff to TSA. Others are doing it, too. Airports are doing it, too. Basically, the idea is that you don't need a uniform screener carrying the bins back to the front of the line, that sort of thing. So the, the airlines and airports sort of helping out with those functions so that the screeners can screen. It's um, look TSA by all accounts and appearances, keeps Americans safe and people who travel to America safe. There are people who would dispute that, but the reality is that, look, there hasn't been a 9-11 since 9-11, and, and it's not only because nobody has tried. Um, you, you know, uh, I mean, intelligence has improved also and so forth. It's not only about the airport checkpoint. But what you what what also, though, um, unfortunately, differentiates the U.S. from a lot of the world is that this situation of having people just waiting hours to be screened is something you don't generally see elsewhere in the developed world. Um, and so it's, uh, no, it's, it's, it's absolutely a commercial mess for airlines, both because of the costs they incur or the direct costs in terms of, you know, reaccommodating passengers who don't make it through the line in time to get to their flight, even though they've shown up two hours before their flight and so forth. And, uh, you know, whatever impact it's having on bookings, people saying, well, I, you know, I'm just not going to bother flying, uh, especially in the shortest haul markets where, uh, you know, we're driving or, or taking a train is, is, uh, is an option. You know, another reason we haven't had it on the show is because 
I don't find it particularly interesting. And I know you think that's, or everybody probably thinks that's sacrilegious. And yes, I think it's extremely important. But the reason I don't find it all that interesting is because I know how this is going to turn out. It's going to get fixed. I have every confidence that in August, maybe even sooner, lines are going to die down. Seth, am I a arrogant fool? <laughs> no, and I agree. You know, not, I mean, from a, you know, in terms of, uh, of an intellectual epre, you know, exercise, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not the most That's, interesting thing. It's, it's, uh, you know, as I said, just, just simple math, you know, you need some more screeners, you need to schedule people better. You need to, you know, some new approaches to doing some things, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, there are more interesting things in the world to talk about, even though, as you said, it's it's uh, very important. Yeah, no, this is going to get better. Look, they are hiring and training new people. The existing people are working more overtime. As I mentioned, the airlines and airports are 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 pitching in. It's going to get solved. It's 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 a solvable problem. Look, there, it's 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 a very busy period right now. I don't know that it's going to be solved by the July Fourth holiday, for example. But already this past weekend, um, the lines were bad, but in some cases it was sort of. Um, People were pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, more often than not, people being told to show up two or three hours before their flights, you know, found themselves with all kinds of time to spare on the uh, on the other side of security once they got airside. The problem is that when you have to tell people to arrive so early, you know, even if most of them in retrospect didn't have to, it, it, you're just really wasting people's time. It's just a huge strain on on, on productivity uh, in, in the country, and uh, you know, and again, it just makes air travel a, a less attractive, but yeah, they're, they're going to fix it. And on that optimistic note, we'll leave it right there. Thanks for joining us in a place where there's never, ever a line to get in the airline weekly lounge. Never a line to get in. That doesn't sound good. Does it? Yeah. We just lost the whole velvet rope crowd. You mean the cool kids? Yeah. Them. I don't know those kids. 